We're just doing it. All right. You're going to edit it, right? I don't know if I can edit it. Here we are. <laughs> We're on a, uh, a coffee slash maybe a lunch break from Claricon. I didn't play in Daniel's game, which is good because he was running me through his tournament scoring last night and he was already afraid I would spoil it. So I didn't get to spoil it, mm -hmm. but I wanted to catch up. Todd does spoil. I'm a spoiler. I am definitely a spoiler. So Daniel, how was your game? It was really good. Really, really good. Yeah. A great group of players, which, you know, of course, that's what makes the game. Really, They really got into it. Uh, I learned something. Every time you run something, you learn something. What one is that, uh, one, well, okay. So in this game, because we, the last time I ran it, I went over the character sheet and everything first. And then we immediately jump into like hex crawling that doesn't use that at all. And then like half an hour into it, we go back to the character sheet for something. And it seemed like people had forgotten because like, you know, it's like the info dump at the beginning. Sure. So I said, this time I'll wait to mention the character sheet until we get deeper into it. But then when we got deeper into it, it was so exciting that I didn't mention some stuff. And then a couple of things went sliding, like what somebody's magic item did and stuff like that, that may have helped a player character. So I felt a little bad, uh, but not that bad. Now, I know you, ha <laughs> you had a couple of people who I know were new to OD&D. &D. I yeah. don't know how new they were. How was that I experience? Think pretty much everybody was, uh, at least to my version of it. The one gentleman I know played, uh, plays a version of OD&D &D with Chicago Wiz. Uh, hey, Chicago Wiz. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but it, of course my version is different than theirs. Right. And it was great. Everybody got right into it. It's, I mean, it's D and D D and D, right? I mean, yeah. So I don't want to get too much of spoilers because I know you run this a lot. Mm -hmm. However, so the, the campaign, I know you have, you have locations that use in the outdoor survival map. Yep. There's one that you want to get to right out of like what nine, there's 10, 10 locations. One is kind of the, the, the main one, but you have to figure out, you got to sort, you got to find them, determine yep. which one is the main one and then beeline to right. that one, presumably. And I know that recently, cause we worked on it last night, you added some scoring to help just kind of help folks. Cause obviously getting through the whole thing, finding it and getting to the bottom of that final dungeon is a lot for potentially for a, uh, a three hour game for a three hour game. So it's, how did it's nearly impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so how did this group do? How did they fare? They did not get to the final All right. uh, location. They didn't discover it. Uh, turns out it was in a place where they, they were like, that was the last place we would have went. So they probably would not have got there. And it's randomized, right? It's there. randomized. So what I do is I take blocks that I wrote letters on them, and then I put them down face down on the table, and I scramble them, and then I just put them in the spots on the map. Not random spots. They're in specific spots. But I don't know what they are either. So sometimes people are like, oh, what's in this one? And I'm like, I have to look. I don't know what that is either, which is good because it keeps it, me fresh. That way I don't have to try to like poker face it, right? I don't know what's anywhere, but what will happen. So what we do is add scoring so that if you just uncover different locations, you get points. You get points for uh, treasure. And I, I don't know. I might add points for combat. I don't know. This group tended to. Did they get you a lot of fights? Okay. They did. They We had, we had six character deaths. As you could see on my, if you go to my short for the <laughs> Hall of Heroes, there was, at least at the time I did, I think there was four from your game. Yeah, I think it was six. six. Yeah, I may have made, in fact, I think it was six and then we might have added two more of those. I don't know if <laughs> they put the last two on there. Uh, but that's because they they chose to fight things where they, maybe they shouldn't have. And maybe that comes from not right, not playing OD&D. &D. I mean, they're tough, but like, for instance, they encountered uh, 13 tigers in the woods. Holy cow. And you, you know, you get a, a sense for the fact that if there's 13 tigers running around the woods, that maybe there's something might be something going on here, and they decided to fight those thirteen tigers, who turned out to be wear tigers. Oh, they did in fact kill all but I think all but five of them, and then the wear tigers morale broke. But they lost three characters in that. A pyrrhic so, victory, if ever I heard one. Yeah, <laughs> three characters and two henchmen. So what was their mode? So you uh, so how do you open it up? I don't think I know. So you, you, the, you, you I know you present it. What is the what is the intro right. for? So the idea of this thing is that. This King Arneson's Mine is basically a dungeon below a castle that's been wiped out by this ancient king. Uh, it's mystery. Like, it's a myth, right? And you're already in the world of D&D, &D, right? So this is something people don't even believe exists. It's some lost valley. What's going on here? And what the player characters have come across, because they're high level, is a map that is clearly, that they think is clearly a map to the mine. But there's these locations marked on it. That's how they know it, right? Because we have the map. Uh, but they don't know what they are. They're in such an ancient language. No magic will interpret it. You just know where the locations are. You don't know what they are. And then... Effectively, they've been traveling, and then they get there. They have, you know, weeks and weeks of rations. They have, like, hundreds of feet of rope. They are, like, I give them a huge ration list. Somebody is in charge of being the, the quartermaster, and we do food tracking, water tracking. They've got, like, 12 mules, like, 22 horses. Like, they really are a big party, and but not by the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Less shares to split by the end. Right. So what I do is I do all those spots randomly. Then I also randomize where they come into the map. Oh, so, okay. and then from there they look and they just go, okay, 
Where do we want to go? What's our most effective path to see as many of these things as possible? Because they don't have any way of knowing what any of them are until they get to some of them. But you say some of them have clues, right? That you can well, right. Of... So what happens is, for instance, that one of the first encounters they had was a good encounter with werebears. They had a positive reaction. They interacted with them. They gave them food. And then the werebears, I had determined, came from an area where one of the things was. And I said, okay, because you had this positive reaction, the werebears are going to tell you what this location is. And then I flipped it over. Oh, and it was not the mines. So I know you said at uh, Gen Con that, right, they got lucky where the first thing they yes. flipped over was the fun. And they still didn't get. They all still didn't get all the way through because I think we started going a little too slow. So I, I have to make sure that the pace stays up even if they know where they're going. Now, because are you can... are you using anything from outdoor survival in terms of like starvation, getting lost or whatever, or are you using yes. ODD? Okay. Well, yes and no, right, because they, they, they cross. I, I kind of adjusted or homebrewed the outdoor survival rules for water and for food. I could probably just actually use outdoor survival rules, but those are pretty harsh. They are harsh. They're very harsh. So what I do is you can roll every day to see if you have water. You can, If you stop on a water spot, you can refill. You can roll every day to see if you find, uh, no, you can find food if you go to food spots. Plus you have iron rations. But then I have them roll to see if like the food spoils and stuff like that. Nice. How did they take to the hex crawly kind of outdoor? Great. Kind of it? Yeah, people loved it. I mean, it seemed like they were on it. Like that, I think the first time when somebody sits down, they, they might be a little intimidated. You know, everybody's always a little quiet at the beginning of a convention. Camp. They're always like, <laughs> Who's then once they start moving, it became like, because I, I assign roles. So I go, all right, you're a quartermaster. Okay. You're a navigator. That means you roll to see if we're lost. You're going to roll. You're the lucky one. You roll to see if you have an encounter. And then the other two people I rolled when we had encounters, one person rolled what tables, the other one rolled what monsters. So Everybody kind of had a role, so that it was a, a role. <laughs> Everyone gets to be unlucky together. <laughs> right. So that way it's not just one person doing everything, right? No, it's, it's not good. just sitting there. So I, I think I want to figure out a way to incorporate it so that all the roles can happen at once. That'd be the one thing I'd improve. Like instead of having the quartermaster make roles, let's say for the water and food, I think next time I'll have the encounter people roll for that. That way everybody at the table rolls die, and I can just say, all right, everybody roll a D6 right now. What did you get? Okay, you're not lost. Okay, what did you get? Okay, and I can just do that. Like a because I like that yeah. sixty six kind of fireball of trouble, <laughs> right? Well, because that's how the combat works, right? The first when you first encounter the combat, because it's a this my system. Let's say it's fantasy combat. You I have to go through the chart and figure out the thing, and I go okay, blah blah. blah. So your number is nine. Just remember that. And then the first round is a little slow. It goes around. Everybody gets to the next round. I go okay, your number is exactly the same. Everybody just roll your dice. Tell me if you hit. And so like round two, round three, it's just like that. So combats are quick. Oh, what were you using? Was it using fantasy or It was true? mostly fantasy because okay. uh, they encountered lycanthropes, which was fantasy only. They encountered a Balrog, but they ran. <laughs> they encountered... Smart, few... because in Daniel's other game, we didn't run and we got immolated. And well, I guess uh, technically we did run. We just chose, After. chose too late, chose to run later than we should have. Yeah. And they, uh, in one, they re encountered, uh, minotaurs at one point and they had to fight those on troop combat. So okay. we did, a little bit. did you find any trouble getting, moving them between the different modes or did they pick up on it pretty quick? They picked up on it pretty quick. Nice. Anything particularly memorable that they did? Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. So basically again, cause just like anything, emergent story, right? They have this goal. They have these points they want to get, but they went to this patriarch's uh, castle and she said, well, I need you to do something for me. Cause that's what Odini tells you to do. If you show up at a patriarch's castle, they, they quest you. And I'm like, I'm not going to make them do it, but I'm going to say she wants you to do this and she'll give you information. And they had to go fight these vampires. And I knew we were getting close. We only had, had like half an hour left. So I, in my head, I'm like, this is probably the end. They're going to go to this vampire castle and this is going to be a, a confrontation or something. So it ended up that being, it was very cool because we did like a little mini dungeon crawl. I added that. <laughs> I mean, I knew the vampires were there because I had already enlisted, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know the patriarch was going to. Right. Fire them, right? You don't know what's going to happen. And they chose to take it, and then they went in. They used invisibility and used some of the. And you said somebody like sacrifice. Who was it that you yeah, said? Yeah, the one one player uh, was playing a dwarf, and they were just like everybody else was like, "All right, we're going to go back and hide over here." And he was like, "I'm going to stand in the hallway where they might come." And he said, "When they get close to me, I'll make like a cross with my two weapons or whatever." Oh, that's unfortunately smart. initiative. Uh, it was not in their favor. <laughs> and uh, and also it was dark. And of course, they can't see in the dark in OD&D. &D, so uh, they did actually almost kill the vampire in that first round of combat, wow. but was were level trained and destroyed, which was That's awesome. what happens. That's what happens. Yeah. So good times. Uh, I played in a, a Veiled Society, which is, uh, I think it's a BX module. I think, a B, I don't know if it's Beckman basic. Team. Yeah. Is it a Beckme module mm -hmm. or a BX module? Either way, uh, it was a lot of fun. We didn't get particularly far. I think we were told we got to page seven out of 16, but everyone was new to Beckme. And I, of course, Beckme is not my natural system. So it's always interesting to see the differences. And uh, as I as I put some pictures and I did talk to the author because somebody sent me a comic. I posted the pictures of the cheat sheet that he gave us. Right. And also his house rules kind of 
summary document. Right, I was going to say there was house rules there. Right? There you was house playing rules. some kind of like cleric thief comedy. I was playing a trickster. What was I? A uh, yeah, like a, a yeah, it was like a human trickster something. But yeah, I was basically half cleric, half thief. That's interesting. Uh, Loki. Yeah, I was I was Norse. And somehow we got this Wild West theme because I named myself Hob because I checked out Norse <laughs> names right. or Hod. And then the other guy named himself Duke. And then another <laughs> came around and then the other guy named himself, I get what, but it was another like brute, like John Wayne name. So I finally <laughs> said that my last name must be Haas. So we had like Duke and whatever and Haas. <laughs> and then some other guys joined up. I don't think they stuck with the John Wayne theme, uh, yeah. but it was fun because a lot of folks were new to Beck Me. So it was interesting just in terms of, I know some people reached out to me about uh, the con in general. And I think that. Presumably, you're going to do more of these. I feel like this is. A, I feel like if we yeah. ask the dungeon minister, they say this is a success. Yeah, they're probably like going to be. Yeah, the games more. are packed. People are very friendly. They're very friendly, really and 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 it, there's probably a focus on Beck Me, and and certainly on old school gaming. You, you ran O D and D. Yeah, maybe OSC next time I'll run now. something. OSC is being run, and then it definitely seemed like there were a few folks at our table who were really interested in playing, specifically playing Beck Me. So we right. weren't the fastest party, and. You know, people were getting used to things like no being able being able to see in the dark. Well, we had an elf with infravision, but then the guy playing the halfling, you know, was shocked when halflings couldn't see in the dark. Yeah. Uh, we did have some thieves, but there was a lot of just being slow and cautious. So we didn't get too far, but we all had a blast. And we were considering playing on, but folks had signed up. To other, we would have actually kept going because everyone was really interested. Yeah, it looked like you were having a great time, yeah. But other people would sign up for other games. We didn't want to mess things up too much. So What did you think uh, about those miniatures? They were using like a little cool miniatures, too, little paper miniatures, right? Yeah, they were good. Yeah, yeah. So like, was what was it, like Order the Stick or I don't know, they're yeah. kind of stick figure-esque. There's a picture of that also. Yeah, they were fun. And he was just drawing. He had he didn't have a uh, like a Chessex map, but he just had a big graph paper, I, you know. Then he was just drawing the map and placing us there, and it worked perfectly well. And we just kind of picked out whichever. And the nice thing, I think, for him is that you can have a box of those. And because it's paper, they're really light, right? So right. it's not like you had to worry about metal or other, you know, don't, can't, don't worry, you have to bend them or anything. They're just little standees, basically. Super lightweight, really good. Uh, his name was Robert, I think, and I believe, unless he forgets, he's going to send me those, send me some, ha send me some of his house rule stuff that he said it was okay for me to share. So okay. if you're interested in kind of a house rule Beckman, it looks like he did a lot of work because you could see on one of the things he had little spreadsheets where he had made up basically like, the XP costs of different, different things. So it's, it might be a good um, rabbit hole to dig into. I wonder if they use the. Um... Oh, that's a pretty. I don't know if it's from one of the magazines, but there's a thing where you can like rebuild characters. Like there's, a, or maybe it's a blog article. But of course, I don't know what it is now. Somebody say in the comments it's where fine. like they break down what things cost, and then you can build characters that are supposed to be balanced with XP. He might be done. I don't know if he did it himself or if he used that, but it seemed like he had it all in Excel or something, and then yeah. he kind of screenshotted it or did whatever. So it seems like he did a pretty comprehensive job. It was yeah. a lot of fun. There's another gaming slot. Well, there's one going on right now which we're not playing, and then there's a one later which you might be running something. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe. at the last minute I threw my name in. That's we'll see. Anyway, so. I'm a free agent, so I'll just go wherever I'm needed. <laughs> I will be there. Anyhow, folks are asking me where the heck's Daniel. You say you're going, to <laughs> Daniel. And he's not in any of the vlogs. Well, here he is. There I am. There he is. Anyway, we'll we'll post more later on. We're oh, and shout outs to uh, what is this Main Street Main Market Street, yeah. over here? Delicious coffee, beautiful yeah. shop, outdoor area. You can't see, but uh, kind of over. There, there are all these wonderful fire, not fire pits, because they're not in pits, but what do you call those things? Fire, like little outdoor fireplace kind of thing? Yeah, they're like raised up with a Raised up, some logs. chairs, and if, I could, if any of them were still free, we would have snagged one, yeah. but we're we're out here. It's actually probably good to record, but yeah. uh, really wonderful place if you're, I don't know, and where where are we? We're Glen Williams, Ontario. Yeah. So if you're ever in Glen Williams, Ontario, go to Main Street Market. Maple latte is very good. <laughs> Delicious scones, and I got a sandwich in my pocket that I'm going to eat as soon as I hit the stop button. Anyhow, we'll be back. We'll be back later. Todd has a sandwich in his pocket. I got a sandwich in my pocket. I'm not afraid to use it. All right, folks. Game on, and we'll talk to you later. Say bye, Daniel. Bye. -bye.